Good evening, everybody. I am Michael Waldman. I'm the president of the Brennan Center for Justice here at NYU School of Law. We are thrilled to welcome you to this conversation uh, about some of the most urgent, exciting, fascinating, and ongoing developments in the history of our country and front row witnesses uh, to that history. Um, before we start, I'm going to pretend like we're at a Broadway show and tell you to turn your phone on to vibrate, uh, that, to silent. That is because we are live streaming this. We are going to have this up on our website, sending it out to our newsletter lists, and perhaps even one day if we uh, can make the buttons work getting going in a podcast. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Brennan Center for Justice is a nonpartisan law and policy institute, as I say here at the law school, affiliated with the law school. We work to reform and renew and when necessary, defend the institutions of justice and democracy in America. We were started more than two decades ago by the family and clerks of the late Supreme Court Justice William Brennan as a memorial not to his specific opinions but to his vision that at the heart of the law had to be a notion of common human dignity and that the way to understand the Constitution was not merely as words scratched on parchment and not merely what those guys in the powdered wigs thought it meant way back when, but as a document that means something for every generation that helps us, all of us, meet our own challenges in our own times. This is a moment when those institutions of democracy and when that constitution is stretched tight, when it's facing challenges that we have not seen and have not felt in a long time. We all know, and the Brennan Center has been deeply engaged in the work of documenting and opposing that there are challenges to the right to vote in America of a kind we have not seen in a long time. We, and uh, the, the most recent news, the, some of you who've been here with us before know uh, the, there's good news, bad news, and mixed news. We continue our fight against the harshest voter ID law in the country, the Texas voter ID law. That is the one where you not, are not allowed to use as your government ID your University of Texas ID, but you can use your concealed carry gun permit. 608,000 people were disenfranchised by that law, and our string of victories continues in the litigation against it with one change relevant to this conversation. The Justice Department has now switched sides and has withdrawn from opposing that racist and illegitimate law. We've enga we're engaged in the fight for gerrymandering reform and to end partisan gerrymandering at the Supreme Court. And there is actually, in the last few weeks, good news, we hope, potentially good news, in that it appears very possible that a majority of the court will, for the first time in American history, draw a line and say that when politicians draw their own lines to cut voters out and entrench their own party, that's not just a bad idea, it is actually unconstitutional. We're very hopeful. And we're continuing our research and our work to end mass incarceration for criminal justice reform, to avoid a turn back to misguided policies that didn't make us safer, but which gave us by far the biggest population of prisoners relative to our population in the world and on and on. Now so many of these problems, as you know, are long standing, and so many of them have come to a boil in recent years as our country has changed, as our economy has changed, as inequality has deepened, as whole sections of the country have been left behind, and as the political system didn't listen. We're living in interesting times, a product of a mismatch between the country we live in and the government and political system that we find ourselves having. And that is what this conversation is about today. Uh, before I hand over the microphone, I wanna say what a thrill it is for all of us who watched election 2016. Um, we couldn't take our eyes off it, even as we sometimes <laughs> screamed in horror. And I couldn't um, take my hands off the glass of wine. <laughs> exactly. Um, what a great treat it is for all of us to have Katie Turr here 
Um, the Washington Post publisher, Philip Graham, is famous for having said that uh, journalism is the first rough draft of history. And this book, it more than lives up to that. Future historians, that presumes, by the way, that we have a future and historians, but future, <laughs> wow. future historians will turn to this book as a really uh, valuable document about this campaign and the country at this moment. It's really well written and riveting, almost as gripping and never as horrifying as what we all watched in real time. So we're really delighted to have you here. And to uh, join in a conversation with Katie Turr is Irin Carmone. She is, among other things, the co-author of the book, The Notorious RBG, which as she pointed out to me, her co-author was an NYU student mm -hmm. who came up with that, uh, that nomenclature just shortly after the legendary dissent in the Shelby County decision, uh, the decision that we believe gutted the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, she is a well-known journalist. She work, does work for the Washington Post. She is uh, producing and uh, doing a documentary for The Intercept on the rise of women in politics in the recent election and going forward, which we can't wait to see, and we're grateful to you for uh, being part of this conversation and for being here today. So thank you again on behalf of all of us. Thank you, Michael. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Yeah, you ready for this? <laughs> I'm Irene Carmone. Uh, co-author of Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I am so thrilled to be sitting here with my friend, former colleague, uh, Katie Turr, who, among her other numerous accomplishments, including 500 days, 40 states with Trump, including the New York Times bestseller list, she's the author of Unbelievable, My Front Row Seat to the Craziest Campaign in American History. Now. Among the other reasons that we're sitting on the stage together is that we share the fiercest, most visionary, and most tireless editor in the book industry, Julia Chapin. <laughs> that Chapin's. is an understatement. Yes. She is, she is uh, tough. Yes. Tough. Call you at all hours of night. I always have suggestions. Push you to your limits, editor, in a good way. Well, I just want to recognize Julia Chaffetz for those 2 a.m. text messages. You had great ideas. Um, Anyway, I want to let everybody know that you can check out the Brennan Center's videos and podcasts at brennancenter.org. You can follow them on Facebook and Twitter to find out more about what Michael was talking about. Um, and you should definitely read Katie's book, because even if you think you know everything that happened in the campaign, even if you watched every hourly hit that Katie did at MSNBC and Nightly News and The Today Show and Meet the Press, even if you weren't sleeping while Katie was not sleeping, you have something to learn from this book. So I suggest you pick it up, and I understand it will be available later. I'm also available for hugs for those of you who did all those things, because that is complete <laughs> insanity. I, I think we all needed a hug after the election. Um, but, but, but maybe you in particular. So I, I want to start out by asking you, for, for, for those misbegotten souls that have not yet read your book, by the way, I don't think that there are so many people judging by the sales. Mm. But let's say there's someone in this room that has, for some poor reason of poor judgment, not yet read your book. Give us a sense of the arc. Um, OK, so it is, it's not just a straight timeline, but it, it, it does start um, uh, on election night. Um, and in the moment on election night where it becomes clear that Donald Trump is going to win. I'm not sure if you remember this. Uh, <laughs> no, I, well, unless you were blacked out. Uh, well, do you, but do you remember the actual moment? What happened? What time was it? Some of us went come to bed. Come on, guys, come on, guys. It was 11 o'clock. Uh, it was when Florida was called for Donald Trump. And I felt sick to my stomach. I thought I was going to throw up. And the first line of the book is, I am about to throw up. <laughs> Which I was entirely sure that NBC was going to cut out. You cannot say that. 
Um, but it wasn't because uh, of any sort of partisan politics, not because a Republican was winning or a Democrat was winning. It was because of the way Donald Trump turned um, our world upside down and how he questioned basic facts. He was questioning the integrity of our democracy. Uh, we forget, but he was at the end of it talking about a rigged system and this grand conspiracy that was being uh, perpetuated by the banks, the big banks, and the Clintons, and the media establishment. There were some re really revealing undertones, or not so undertones, overtones to what he was implying with that. Um, and, and then there was the excess Hollywood tape. I mean, it just, it did, it defied reality. And being on the road for as long as I was, I realized that he wasn't going to stop going on the road to do these victory rallies. So I, I was kind of thrown for a loop in that moment. Um, so it starts off with that, but then we backtrack in the next chapter to um, Paris in 2015. I was a foreign correspondent before I got assigned this story, and I was, I was living uh, what could only be described as a romantic life overseas when I had wine at lunch and a French boyfriend and far-flung um, European assignments, uh, assignments in Indonesia. Foreign correspondent is the world's best job at a news network, right? I mean, if you're, yeah. I yeah, I mean, so. they pay for your travel. Yeah. I mean, it's great. And they pay for I all mean, your travel food. travel writers up there, but yeah. Yeah, okay. As long as there are no bombings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, if you're not in a war zone. It could be interesting, though. Yeah. That's in the mind of a journalist. You're crazy. Um, anyway, so it, it, it goes back from there, and then it, and then it is a, a bit of a, um, um, a linear progression towards Election Day, but it's interspersed uh, with little vignettes from Election Day itself. So it can kind of be a little bit, a little confusing, a little jarring, uh, but it, it conveys how um, hard it was to just to stay up to date with this campaign. Remember all the wild things that happened. Um, and I, I can assure you that there are things that happened that you do not remember, even if you did watch every single day. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of personal moments from me about what it was like to be a journalist on this campaign and what it was like to be called out by Donald Trump and what it was like to have armed security. We didn't talk about it uh, while we were out, but we did have armed security. And what the Trump supporters were like one-on-one, -on -one, what the campaign was like behind the scenes. So it pulls back the curtain. It gives you a very personal look at, um, at 2016 and also does remind you of all the wild things that took place that defied expectations and defied the odds. So you talked about how you had this charmed existence, but you, you didn't explain how was it that you ended up living this insane Trump. Okay, so life. so so I, I'm in London. I'm a foreign correspondent. I, I come back uh, to New York uh, to fulfill a make a wish and to remind my bosses that I exist because even though it's a great assignment being overseas, they tend to forget about you. So I'm I'm standing around the newsroom shooting the shit with one of my colleagues, Brad Jaffe, uh, who you might know from Twitter, if any of you are on Twitter. Um, and uh, Donald Trump had just announced he was being dropped by Macy's, he was being dropped by Univision, he was being dropped by NBC, uh, his pageant, and they needed somebody to cover it. And because he had said that Mexico was not yes, sending its best people. Because Mexico rapists. was sending rapists, some of them he assumes were good people. Uh, anyway, so I'm standing around uh, the newsroom and one of my bosses says, oh, Katie, do the story. And then do the story another day. And then do the story another day. And then the president of NBC News decides, why don't we put Katie Turr on the campaign full time? And everyone laughed because it's ridiculous, but they did. Um, and I was assured that it would be six weeks tops. <laughs> <laughs> Famous last words. Famous last words. I mean, it was cinematic. It was one of, uh, one of my bosses was telling me as he walked to another meeting, it wasn't even an important enough assignment to sit down in his office and explain it to me. He just basically told me in passing, you're gonna stay here for the summer and it's gonna be uh, interesting, you're gonna follow Donald Trump, and oh, if he makes it to the White House, uh, you'll go to the White House. Steps into an elevator, the elevator doors close. <laughs> so you, at this point, you're, you're not really 
focusing on politics. Nobody even thinks that Trump is politics, right? So no, they how do we, he's not going to release like his a side fine, show. Yeah, he's a right? side show. He's not going to release his financials. If he goes to the debates, he's going to get laughed off stage. Charles Krakauer, uh, Krakauer was calling um, uh, him a sideshow, a carnival barker, a, um, a clown. The Republicans were not taking him seriously. They didn't like this insurgency campaign. They thought it was a distraction. It was a way for him to get attention. Um, and and I, the campaign itself didn't really believe that they were going to go anywhere. This is the expectations that um, somebody on the campaign put to me very early on, senior person on the campaign, was that it was one in 10 that they would make it to the RNC. One in 10. Um, so they just thought that they were going to protest the system. They were going to get some headlines. Uh, they would maybe pick up a few votes, and, and that would be that. We all assumed that Donald Trump would drop out before a single vote would, was cast. Why? Because he has no attention span, or because he wasn't getting traction? Because he has no policy other than he didn't like Mexicans, right. and he wanted to build a wall. Because he had no experience. To be fair, that is quite the agenda. Yeah, well, I mean, apparently yeah. that was enough of a policy. He had no experience <laughs> in public... Um, uh, in public office. He didn't serve in the military. He had said he was going to run before and he didn't actually run. I mean, he didn't seem serious about the campaign at all. He had no staff. He had no fundraising. He had no real plan. He was just getting on his plane and going places and rambling on for sometimes 90 minutes. Um, and it didn't, it just wasn't coherent. So people presumed that this was a, a, just one big joke. It might have been entertaining to people, but it was the silly season. And then, you know, football would start and people would pay attention to football or Homeland would be back on television and they'd watch Homeland. And by, by Thanksgiving, his poll numbers will drop. By Christmas, his poll numbers will drop. By January, there's no way they're going to take him seriously. His poll numbers will drop. He will lose the Iowa caucus. He did lose the Iowa caucus, so they were <laughs> right about that. Um, but that was really the last time that he lost. So he just, he defied the odds because he was getting these, I mean, you remember this. He was getting these wild crowds. 20,000 people showed up for him in Mobile, Alabama. I, I think he's mentioned them a few times. But he, no, he said 40,000. Right. Okay. Fact check Close. on the ground, it was 20,000. But, but so free, okay, so, so you, this assignment turns out to be not just a summer it turns out not to just be a lark. It starts to, it takes over your life. But you also, at the same time that you're riding this wave, you have your own interactions with him. I remember really clearly us airing these interviews all day while I was working at MSNBC, your first interview with him. Um, tell us about the dynamic that you had from the start with Trump. So the very first uh, Trump rally I ever went to was on um, June 30th of, of 2015. It's the same day that I got assigned the campaign full time. And I, I drove uh, up to New Hampshire to go to a, a rally around a backyard pool. It was a couple hundred people. It was very small. Um, Donald Trump wasn't a thing at this point beyond the, the negative headlines about um, sending Mexican rapists over the border. Um, and I get there, it's raining. He's, he's talking on this step and repeat. He's rambling on about um, how he gets more standing ovations than anybody, something he repeats a lot, um, even to this day. Uh, he's talking about um, how he's uh, standing by his statements about Mexico and Mexicans, and he's going after the media. And I remember typing in my, I was tweeting, Donald Trump revives, you know, political trope that the media is the enemy. And as I think I'm typing this, he, he calls me out. I have no reason to believe that he knows who I am, knows my name. We've never met before. We've never shared the same air. And he says, Katie hasn't even looked up at me once. And I, I didn't even look up because I presumed he wasn't talking about me. I got this hard nudge in my side um, by my producer, and I realized that everybody, including Donald Trump, is looking at me. And I, and I, I mean, what do you say to that? I'm like, I'm tweeting what you're saying. I screamed it across the pool. Uh, and he, he liked that, so he just kept going with his speech. Tell me more about me. <laughs> exactly. 
He's Katie, you, you do a good job. And then he, he moved on. And um, anyway, so I, I went to his press person afterwards, uh, this young girl named Hope Hicks, who was wearing this really pretty sundress. And um, I said, can I have an interview with him? And she said, yeah, probably just wait out back and uh, he'll, he'll come out and talk to you. And so I feel good. I mean, I can put this on the Today Show the next day. I'm not assigned, but if I get a pull aside with Donald Trump, then maybe they'll put, put me on the air. And um, next thing I know, he ends his speech, walks out the door, and his big black SUV speeds away. <laughs> I'm like, well, so much for that interview. Um, but Hope calls me and says, we'll give you a sit down. So a few days later, I go to Trump Tower to do a sit down with Donald Trump. And I had been preparing uh, all night the night before and um, trying to think of questions, trying to find ways that I can push back on his rhetoric, push back on these uh, stats or these beliefs that he has about um, crime in, in, in Mexico. And I find Pew Research that, that talks about how uh, crime in border cities is actually lower than interior cities and crime by um, people who were born Born here is actually higher than people who cross the border. Um, and I sit down and I'm, I'm, I'm warned by Chuck Todd that Donald Trump is probably going to go after me because I'm NBC News. I figured as much. I mean, I remembered him from The Apprentice. He was always fighting with Omarosa, so I presumed he would fight with me. Um, you guys do have a lot in common. I, clearly. <laughs> Did you read that story about her in The Daily Beast, by the way? Uh, that, that she doesn't know what her job is. Or Politico? Yeah. That's a great... you got to watch, read that story if you haven't well, already. since you and I both just got married this year, I feel like really inadequate that we did not get our wedding photos taken at the White I, House. I know, I know. We should have had a catered lunch at the White House. Um, anyway, so I, I sit down and he... And I, you know, he's treating it almost like a celebrity interview. He, he's saying, do you want to have a, a photo with me? And I'm like, I don't... <laughs> really want a photo with you? I don't know what to say. So I'm like, I guess, okay. And so there's this very awkward photo of me just standing next to Donald Trump, like confused face as he's smiling. And I remember thinking, I hope the, you know, the cameras aren't rolling on this because my bosses in New York are going to be like, this girl doesn't know what the heck she's doing. Right. Why are she's we sitting her here? Yeah, she's starstruck and just, this is going to be a softy interview. Um, but we sit down and I, you know, the first question I asked, he did not like. I asked, why are we sitting here? Why aren't you campaigning in New Hampshire as everybody else is? It's 4th of July, uh, the weekend after 4th of July. Why wasn't he out? Um, and then I proceeded question after question, talking about uh, the Pew Research, uh, pushing him on uh, this belief that Mexicans, uh, Mexico was sending rapists and they were criminals, asking him if he owned a gun, and if he did, does he shoot it, over and over and over again. So he doesn't like any of it, and he's angry, and he, at some point, I try to, I try to ask a question, and he tries to, to steamroll me, and he tries to throw me off my game, and he, I stumble, and he says, you can't even get it out. He mean, he's nasty. And I remember sitting there thinking, you know, who, who cares? It's Donald Trump. And I'm, I'm smiling ear to ear the whole time, because... No, this, I so wish we could still say that. Who well, just because it was, it was so surreal. And I, I mean, there was no reason for him to be that defensive. I mean, this, I was presenting him with facts. I mean, most people, when you're presented with contradictory facts, like say, you know, say, hey, you didn't actually have the biggest electoral win, even you though you're claiming. Have an you have a bit of shame. Yeah, you have a bit of shame. And you say, oh, that's, you know, there's... I'm going to look at who told me that, or you, or you try to explain it. Donald Trump doesn't care. He just rolls right through and says, you're wrong, even though you're not wrong. Okay, so, so can we talk about this? Because you know this was something that would recur your experience with him. Um, why did you get under his skin? What do you think it was now that you have some distance from it? I think I got under his skin because I think very early on he um, wanted softer coverage from me. I, he presumed that I wasn't a political person, maybe because I was a woman, maybe uh, because I didn't have a you know a lengthy background and you know I wasn't 20, 30 years into my career. I was only 10 years into my career. Um, I, for some reason, I I got under his skin. He wanted me to be nicer to him, but also because for a long stretch of time, I was the only uh, correspondent who was following him day in and day out. There were, 
from from ju- June 30th to about uh, Thanksgiving, there was a you know a few correspondents from other networks would come in and out or from papers, but I was there every single time he was on the road, and I was standing outside of Trump Tower every single day. So he knew that in this crowd of people. He knew that I was always back there. Oftentimes, I was the only recognizable face for him. And he cares about television in a different way. He cares about TV. NBC had a longstanding relationship with, with The Apprentice. And I think it was a a number of factors that made it um, extra um, frustrating for him that I wasn't more of a cheerleader for his campaign. I want to talk more about all those elements, but I feel like I didn't give you a chance to say his final words to you when that first interview concluded. What did he say to you? So he stands up, he takes off his mic, and he says to me, you will never be president. (laughs) I mean, fair. (laughs) And I, 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 I said, I am not running for president. Wait, what did you? What do you wish you had said, though? I bit my tongue. I was. I almost said, "Neither will you." <laughs> I almost said it, and then I was like, "You're a journalist. You can't say that." So you had to be professional, and now you don't get to be proven wrong. So he would have had the last laugh on that. He did win, as he's mentioned to us several times. Um, so okay. Um, I, I, There's a chapter in your book, the title is, uh, I had to grab Katie and kiss her, which is the exact words verbatim of the President of the United States. Most of the chapter titles are are things that he said to me in that time period, that is including that one. So tell me about what that refers to. So, and then I have some Uh, follow-ups. To to make it a shorter story, because I know Julia is probably telling, thinking that I talk too long. Um, To make it a shorter story, uh, Morning Joe set in November of 2015. There had been a debate uh, in Wisconsin the night before. I was on set talking to Mika and Joe. I was prepared to talk about Russia, because around this time, he was saying nice things about Vladimir Putin. It didn't make any sense. Um, But instead, Mika asked me about his tone change. She was nicer to Ben, J- uh, ben Jacobs, Ben uh, Carson, not, not the Guardian reporter, Ben Carson uh, than he had been. And I, I, I guess I kind of softballed that hit, and Donald Trump liked it. And when he, when he walked into the Morning Joe set, because he was appearing um, uh, in their town hall, which was airing in New Hampshire, he, the first thing he did when he saw me standing off to the side was walk up to me and kiss me on the cheek. And... I mean, I, I, you know, you kiss your colleague on the cheek sometimes as a greeting, a colleague you know well, a family member, a friend. It's not an unusual thing amongst your peers or your loved ones. It is very unusual among uh, it with a an interview subject or a subject that you're covering, or say a presidential candidate to the reporter <laughs> that's following her, his campaign. So he did that, and I remember I froze because I didn't really know what to do, and I I freaked out in the moment because it it was inappropriate, but more than that, it was, I thought if my bosses saw it, just like that picture, they weren't going to take me seriously. And if viewers saw it, they were not going to take me seriously. They would presume that I wasn't fair, that I was leaning more towards this candidate. and I, I, I sought out the, one of the producers of Morning Joe, and I said, please tell me. The cameras did not catch that. And as I'm asking him it, Donald Trump is on set with Joe and Mika, and he says, what happened to Katie? She's so nice, I just kissed her. <laughs> he says, this is on national okay. television. And I'm like, well, I guess there goes that. And I remember what? getting a bunch of messages from people I know, and I think including my bosses, saying, what the, what the F happened? Well, I mean... I know that you are still in objective journalism land, so I'm going to say what I think about that, which is that, and I would love to hear your interpretation to the extent possible, you know, which is that he was trying to put you in your place, that he was trying to send exactly the message you just described, 
which is that you weren't to be taken seriously, but doing so, I think, in a very gendered way. And if I had to psychoanalyze what, what it was about you that got under his skin is that you are a beautiful woman in the way that he also understands beauty who was not going soft on him, who was being a serious journalist, who was asking him questions that he didn't like. It's a very similar effect to <laughs> Megyn Kelly. He does not like women who fit his standards of what is beautiful, who then change challenge him. It gets under his skin. I did not see him do what he did to you to male journalists and gin up the crowd. And I, I guess I'm curious, you know, does, does any of that resonate with you? I know it's, it's a little bit hard to talk about, but did you feel like that he was trying to treat you like you were some little girl not to be taken seriously I in a gender way? I have way? a lot of, of thoughts about that. Um, one, I, I can't get into his head, so I can't say... Uh, I can't say with any real confidence that that's what he was trying to do. Um, I also, I, I kind of, I bristle at that line of questioning because in it, there's a, there's a supposition that, you know, just because I am a woman, I shouldn't be taken seriously. And that kind of makes me uncomfortable because it just presumes, people make the pre presumption that, oh, well, naturally no one's going to take her seriously because she's got blonde hair and whatever else. I don't, I just, I, I don't like it. Um, but I, I think mean, it's he not went an after, endorsement, it's a description of what he's doing. But I think he doing. went after, and I'm not, I'm not defending him, I think what he did to journalists in general was appalling, but he did, he did also go after men. Mm -hmm. He called Tom Yamas a sleaze. Um, he, he picks on and pushes back on Jim Acosta quite a bit. I wasn't the only journalist in his crosshairs, but I was maybe the most, I was the most frequent journalist in his crosshairs. He does use different terminology for women, different terms. He'll call like Mika Brzezinski kooky a lot. Right. Um, Crazy girlfriend, etc. Yeah, that sort of thing. I, I, I don't want to say that what your your interpretation of it is wrong, but I do think there's more to it than that. I do think that because I was always there, mm -hmm. he and I was there from the beginning, he wanted more from me than he was going to get. He wanted me to be nicer. I think also because I was NBC. Right, and so what's so interesting is that working for a company like NBC, um, where I used to work, there is, you, you even, you quote a colleague of yours who says, you're not the story, right? The news is the story at a place like NBC that's a legacy brand. It's so much about the tradition and upholding the institution and the franchise of the Today Show and Meet the Press. And you're not supposed to be the story, but he made you the story. So what did that feel like when you show up, you're just trying to do your job, right? But all of a sudden, this also is described in great detail in the book, and, and I'm sure a lot of you guys remember this, he's essentially leading a crowd in a chant against you, right? He's kind of whipping up the crowd to say, you know, Katie's lying, Katie's not doing this, and so on. So it's how do you navigate doing your job while this is all happening, he's making you the story. You know, you compartmentalize. I, I, that's uh, just part of your job as a journalist. You have to put certain information to the side so you can focus on this information. Especially when you're day in and day out covering a campaign. I mean, it was relentless. I was up at five or six every morning and I was going until 10 or 11 every single night, oftentimes then driving an hour to a hotel and getting up again uh, at five or six to get on a plane. I mean, it was just, it was nonstop. So you don't have time to focus on any of the things that, that Donald Trump may have said about you or to you or the crowds he may have whipped up against you. It's, it's not helpful to get through your job. Also, it is not about you. And we're, we get into this business, so people who get into the business to be a real journalist, because they're, they care about the story more than they care about themselves. Um, so I wasn't trying to make it bigger than it was. I didn't think that would that would make me a uh, more credible reporter. I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted it to be about my reporting. But he did keep dragging me in. And it was, and still is, illuminating and very telling 
about why he would go after journalists and why he would go after journalists in a certain way. It, it revealed a lot about his personality, about the way he would govern, about what he can handle and what he cannot handle, uh, criticism that he can't take, facts that he doesn't want to accept. I mean, in that way, it was useful, and it still is useful. And that's part of the reason why I ended up writing the book. You might ask, well, you didn't want it to be about yourself, but you wrote the book, and it's all about it's about your experience in it. I think the book is valuable as a first person story, as a memoir, because it will tell you what it was like day in and day out to be there, to see it, to experience it. I think it's important for people to understand um, what it's like for a journalist, an American journalist, to follow an American politician and to need armed security while doing that. That's not something that we should normalize. It's not something that we should um, overlook. It's not something, I mean, we should be appalled by that. And I wrote it down to put it on the record so that people years from now will remember that this happened in 2016, that our politics got so vile, so angry, so dangerous, that people's lives were threatened. And it wasn't just Katie Turr of NBC News, it was all of the other NBC reporters that were on the trail that had former Secret Service agents with guns protecting them outside of Donald Trump rallies, protecting them outside of Trump Tower here in New York City, but also reporters at CNN and reporters at ABC. You at one point had to be escorted out by the Secret Service with that rally that I mentioned where he, he specifically started talking about you. And I know that this is, it's bigger than just you. It's about press freedom. It's about the very notion of truth and the news. But since Katie Turr is sitting on this stage, let me ask you, what did it feel like? Were you afraid? And how did you deal with it? The Muslim ban rally um, was, the, I guess, the first rally where I, well, not the first, but one of the, um, one of the uh, scariest moments on the campaign trail. Uh, I, I am used to Donald Trump calling me out at that point. He's done it a lot. People have been saying vile things to me. But this was a unique scenario because a few days earlier, he had called me out on Twitter and said I was a liar and I was dishonest for some factual reporting I did about uh, protesters at one of his rallies. And I was getting death threats on my phone. It was just like, it was buzzing nonstop. I describe it as a shock caller. I, I couldn't even look at it. NBC was was concerned about it. And then we go to the this uh, rally in uh, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, and the belly of a, a World War II battleship. And this is the day that Donald Trump is announcing that he doesn't want any Muslims to come into the country. He's going to announce a, he's announcing a ban. Um, and a few weeks, just to remind you what the moment was like, a few weeks earlier, a few a week or so earlier, uh, San Bernardino had happened. The couple that walked into the office um, in San Bernardino and uh, murdered a bunch of people, the terrorism. Um, President Obama had a speech about terrorism on Sunday and on Monday. Donald Trump, in order to reclaim the headlines, in order to prove that he is going to be the toughest on terror, he comes out with this ban. And his message is, the Obama administration is not protecting you. They are allowing these people to come into the country. Your Muslim neighbors are building bombs in their living room. Your other Muslim neighbors are not telling anybody about it because they are protecting them. Your life is at risk. The majority of Republican voters at the time, their biggest fear was that they'd be the victim of a terrorist attack. And oh, by the way, the media is complicit in putting your life at risk because they are not reporting it. So this is a rally where you know you, you have a you tend to have a low, you try to have a low profile. I'm sitting on the um, on the press riser, below the crowds, below, where, below Donald Trump's line of vision. And this is where it's helpful when he knows I'm around. He knows I'll be there. Because suddenly, when he takes the stage, before he gets to the actual Muslim ban, as the crowd is whipped up, as they are angry, as he's already throwing protesters out, he says, Katie Turr, little Katie, she's back there. And he points to me in the crowd and says I'm a liar. The entire place turned on me at once. Thousands of people. 
and remember, we're in the belly of a warship, and we're in this tiny press pen that's only surrounded by bicycle racks, and we are surrounded on all sides. There are men that are standing on their chairs, they're booing, they're saying the sorts of things I don't, I don't want to say in, in polite company. And I, you know, your pulse, um, your pulse uh, starts to speed up, and my phone, again, it starts to go crazy. And the last thing I want to do is deal with a Donald Trump attack. I just want to, I just want him to announce his Muslim ban so I can I can do my job, get through the rally so I can do my job. So he ends up moving on, and so I move on. I do my job. I stand up and I do a live shot for Chris Matthews. And then I do a live shot for Chris Hayes. And Donald Trump ends his rally and a Few people are standing behind me yelling and screaming, and an advanced staffer shoos them away. One of Trump's advanced staffers shoos them away, and then says, you know, Katie, these guys are gonna walk you out. And he points to two Secret Service agents. And they walked me and my producer, Anthony, from the rally down this, this uh, gangway to our car, which is parked with, with Trump supporters. And I remember feeling like in that moment that what if somebody follows me back to my hotel room? We can't go straight back to the hotel room like we zigged and zagged a little bit as if that was gonna throw people off. We went to dinner with a number of other reporters and by the time we got back to the hotel room, we hoped that anybody who might have decided to follow us maybe got bored. That's what you're thinking. And my mom obviously is freaking out. She's crying on the phone. Were you freaking out? I mean, I was, I was, I was trying not to. I was trying to suppress it. But I, I was asked by NBC, do you think you need, you need security? Should we send you someone? And I said, I think you should. And that gave me peace of mind. But I had a hard time going to sleep that night. So what happened to you was sort of a canary in the coal mine of later a kind of assault on the press. The, the extension of the phrase fake news started out just to describe a kind of blatantly false things like the Pope um, endorses Donald Trump or Hillary is dying. Fake news is now attached to long respected news organizations like CNN, the New York Times and NBC. So how does that affect you know, did you have kind of insights based on your experience? I mean, how does a journalist do one's job in the climate where even just you calling it a Muslim ban is contested, right? I mean, that is what it was, right? But, but even just the very basic notions of facts are now being contested by what is now the administration. We're still figuring it out. I mean, I don't think we have a silver bullet to fix this. I. You, you, you try to do your job as best you can. You, you button up all of your reporting. You make sure you double, triple, quadruple check that it is correct. You add more sources to confirm something. It's not just two sources, it's three, it's four sources. You, you try and make whatever you do as accurate and as fair as you possibly can, but that doesn't mean people are suddenly gonna start believing you. I had an inf infuriating situation with a DC cab driver yesterday. I got out of the cab, I was like, I can't talk to this guy. And, I, and I'm the kind of person that will lecture you tonight to talk to people who voted for Donald Trump or voted for Hillary Clinton and are angry at the other side and to try and understand that anger, understand that frustration, because you need to bridge the gap. Without this, with this, this chasm between people, you're shaking your head, this chasm between people, I'm talking to you right now, what's your name? Kareen, you have to talk to Trump supporters. <laughs> You have to, and you have to understand where they come from and why they believe thing, one thing and don't believe another thing, despite facts. Because if you do not, you, you don't say you don't want Donald Trump to win again, I presume you don't want Donald Trump to win again. If you don't do that, someone like Donald Trump or Donald Trump himself will win again because you're not understanding where the other person is coming from. But so why'd you get out of the cab? So I got out of the cab though, sorry. <laughs> oh, cause I, I, I was not taking my own advice. Um, it wasn't that he was a Donald Trump supporter. I don't, I, we never got that far. He was just questioning fake news and he was saying, you must be fake news. And 
it's biased. And I said, I, I just like, I lost it. I'm like, I can't be in this cab. I got to get out of this cab. I just, I'm so sick of having the argument like about what is real and what is not real. I mean, I, we were talking about, about Russia and um, the guy was making, you know, an, an, an equivalency argument, which is that America interferes in elections all the time. Yeah, that might be true. But the American president, it's still his job to protect American democracy. I'm not saying it's good for us to do it. I'm not advocating any of that. But I do think that an American president should be the one believing his his intelligence community over the word of Vladimir Putin. I think that's a basic well, I, I thing. I, for one, find that shocking. Um, but but, that, but that's the thing. There's people no. that that's what makes this so difficult right now is that even that yeah. is contested. Everything is contested. Right. Even if you have all of these agencies and lining up together. I don't know. I don't know how we move forward. I think the fake news problem is only going to get worse because fake news um, proprietors are going to get better at mimicking real news. Right now you can go to abcnews.com and you can go to abcnews.co. They look alike, but only one is a real news website. You might stumble across abcnews.co by accident and start reading an article, and it might kind of strike you as off, but you can't figure out why. Well, but the biggest purveyor of fake news is in the White House. I mean, he's got the platform to, he's still talking. I mean, in the book, you talk about, you use the word lie, right? I mean, these are uh, from, let's, let's just take crowd sizes, right? Because that's an objective fact. How many times have we heard about these historic crowd sizes? This is an empirically verifiable fact. And it's clear that he really thrives in those kinds of ambiguities just by kind of throwing up flares and seeing what happens. And, and you know, there's a lot of smoke and that he runs out of the way. And so, you, you know, you do use the word lie. And in our industry, you know, it's not taken lightly. It implies a kind of knowledge of intent. There's a lot of nervousness about seeming to be biased. But, uh, you know, could you talk about how, how do you, you're being called biased just by saying, you know, like the sky is blue. You know, we're in uncharted territory here. How do you navigate that? I, yeah, I, Rin, I don't know. How do you navigate that? You tell me. I mean, it's, it's, but, but it's, it's you, difficult. You were saying, I mean, was it, you were saying he's lying, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, listen, the New York Times called him a liar. Um, for I mean, I, the New York Times, I, I can't remember the last time they called a politician a liar. I mean, I know people say, well, why can't you call out this person for, for lying? Why can't you say Donald Trump is lying? That is clearly a lie. What Arin said we, it is true. We have very high standards for what we decide is a lie and what we decide is not a lie. And that has to do with intent. You have to be clear about the person's intent. Maybe they don't realize that they are lying. And I think that or maybe it's work. just conventional politician spin. Yeah, right? and I think that 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 does work in Donald Trump's favor quite a bit. I think there are times where he doesn't realize that he is lying, but there are other times where he's said a thing enough times and been corrected enough times to where you cannot call it anything but a lie. Donald Trump was not against the invasion of Iraq. He wasn't. There were no, there were not thousands of Muslims cheering on the streets of New Jersey. That did not happen. He did not invent the phrase, prime the pump. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. There, I mean, there are things where it's just very clear he's lying, but you have to be selective about when you use that word, because if everything is outrageous, if you are alarmed by everything, if you're screaming about everything, nothing cuts through. And I, I, he's, he must thrive on that too, right? Because he has created so many different, I mean, even just reading your book, I was like, that really happened. He's kept so many shows going on at the same time that even if you are inclined to be outraged by all of it, which I must he, confess he, I am, yeah. you, you can't even, you don't even have the energy to keep doing uh, it. He's like somebody who got a stain on his shirt and then instead of changing his shirt or trying to get the stain out, he just kept staining his shirt with a bunch of other things. So, so at some point you just couldn't tell where the first stain was and you just presumed, oh, well, that's the, way this shirt looks. He's so, he's totally, and, right, and, now and it worked. being it made it really hard. polite company. It made it really hard to run against him because do you decide to run against Donald Trump because you think he's a xenophobe? Do you decide to run against him because you think he's a racist? Do you decide to run against him because uh, you think he's an ad admitted uh, sexual assaulter? Do you want to run against him because he doesn't have any idea about what he's talking about when it comes to policy? Do you decide you would want to run against him because he is 
seems to be in bed with Vladimir Putin. I mean, there's so many ways to go after him that it's hard to pick just one. And it all, again, if everything is loud, you can't hear anything. It all gets lost in the mix. And it works to his favor because it makes it sound true when he says they're just out to get me no matter what. Right, right. And then it's just blame the messenger. Um, shoot the messenger, excuse me. Um, let's talk about admitted sexual assaulter. Grab them by the pussy. You write about the Access Hollywood tape. We're now in a moment where many more people than before are telling their stories of sexual harassment, sexual assault, uh, gray areas that felt like abuses of power. Has, has the conversation now made you think back, you know, why not? Why was this not a thing for Trump? Absolutely. I think, um, and, I, and I bring this up every day. We talk about it at 2 p.m. on MSNBC. I mean, not just Roy Moore, but for Harvey Weinstein and for all the men that have been accused and that have lost their, their jobs or their shows or their reputations or their agents or whatever. Um, why are they being seeing the consequence, consequences, suffering the consequences, and why did Donald Trump not? Um, I think we clearly have a different set of standards for entertainment um, and for private Higher businesses. Higher standards for entertainment than presidents. politicians. Yeah. We're seeing, and we're seeing that with Roy Moore. Mm -hmm. uh, because Roy Moore has an R in front of his name, some voters and some people within the Republican Party, not all, some, have decided that it's okay that he's been accused of child molestation because he's not a Democrat and he's better than a Democrat. Um, we have higher standards, you're right, for, for entertainment, um, people in entertainment. I don't know if, the, if, if this happened to Donald Trump right now, if things would have been that different. Because remember at the time, 50 Republican lawmakers, former and current 50 of them, said he should either drop out or um, that they wouldn't vote for him. These are Republican lawmakers who are working with him right now. I mean, they totally flipped. And so my question to them is, if Roy Moore does get elected, are you going to seat him? Right. And what's the difference between that and what is the difference? More minors, I don't know I what the difference is. I mean, I had a I had a Republican strategist on air with me yesterday on, on Meet the Press Daily, and I asked him what the difference was, and he said, "Well, these were very detailed accusations." Reminder: the accusations against Donald Trump were very detailed as well, and I had to remind him of that. You right, know, because I mean, it's been memory hold. It's been memory hold. The People magazine writer Natasha uh, Stoinoff. Uh, described in vivid detail what happened to her in Mar-a-Lago. Summer Zervos described in, in very vivid detail what happened to her at the, the Beverly Hills, I think it was the Beverly Hills Hotel, and the things he said to her. I mean, it goes on and on. These women went on the record and they described exactly what was happening, but, but they don't remember it. And he didn't have a good answer for me about why that was different um, and, and from Roy Moore, or why it's different from Harvey Weinstein, or why it's different from... I don't know, Kevin Spacey or any of the other people that have been accused. Well, it feels like also, in some ways, because we live in such a tribal age, at least for the cause of survivors of sexual assault, it's better for this conversation to happen outside the realm of partisan politics, because then it doesn't get poisoned by those affiliations, and then people can kind of open up without it being about my team is being attacked. But then what happens when it, when it happens in the halls of Congress? Yep. You know, and, and then totally how do you, and, how, and it does. How do you deal with it then? And what about those women? Are they allowed to come out? Are they allowed to be victims without being vilified? Right now, it seems like no. Right, right. And, and it does feel like we're almost, it's, it's maybe on some level, we're having this belated reckoning that started with Trump. And it didn't happen really in time to fully come to fruition before the election. Um, okay, I'm seeing a sign that says Q&A, so I'm just gonna quickly say, <laughs> this is NYU Law School's Bread and Center for Justice program, and we are talking to Katie Turr. I'm Irene Carmon, your moderator. You can follow NYU Law School's Brennan School for Justice on Facebook and Twitter, listen to all of our programs on our iTunes podcast, and on our website, brennancenter.org. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question before we go to the Q&A. Um, you talk about, you have a kind of imposter syndrome that you talk about in this book. You, you talk about how you don't feel like a real political reporter. You're an outsider. Are you now an insider? 
I still have that uh, syndrome. I still feel like, why in the world are you people here listening to what I say? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't feel like I'm an insider so much because I'm not in Washington. Uh, I made a choice not to go to Washington because I didn't, I didn't want to be in that press briefing room. I, I didn't want to become a creature. Uh, I thought what was so effective about my reporting during the campaign trail was that I didn't have a lot of preconceived notions about what the rules are when it came to running a, a political campaign, a presidential campaign. And I think that helped. I was able to um, adequately assess and more, more honestly assess his support so I, you remember I these calls, these morning exchanges we'd have at NBC where the entire company gets on the call. I, I sounded like the uh, Simpson meme, old man yells at cloud, <laughs> because I was like, these people out here do not care. And they're still showing up, and they're wait. There are thousands of them waiting uh, for hours on end in the freezing cold or the blistering heat. They are here to see Donald Trump, and and it sounds like a big deal in Washington and in New York City. It is not a big deal out here, and you are missing the story. Why do they support him despite? all of the allegations. They support him because of all of the allegations or all of the controversies. So They like pissing you off, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that I, I, by not going to Washington, I've been able to salvage some of that, save some of that. Uh, I think the real test, though, will be being out on the road for 2020. Oh, my God, please don't mention it yet. Um, okay, but yes, absolutely. Okay, who would like to line up to ask a question? And we have a microphone up here. And I, I, my main request is let it be a question. Um, please do not say more than one sentence if you can at all help yourself because I know a lot of people will have questions for Katie here. So, so please respect her time and the time of everyone here. Hey. Hi, thank you both for joining us tonight maybe a little bit more than a sentence, but I think it's e easy for many of us to forget the humanity of Trump supporters. And there's a moment in your book where you talk about a woman helping you do your hair in the bathroom before a Trump rally. Love that scene. And then 10 minutes later, you know, these people are screaming at you with all kinds of you know, vitriolic words and whatnot. How did you make sense of that at the time? And how can your experience remind us of the humanity of Trump supporters? It's a bit of a mom mentality inside those rallies where no rules applied. You could just scream and say whatever you wanted. There was no, um, uh, there was no code of conduct. Uh, you can call people names and it was okay as long as you're in that rally. Uh, but I met Donald Trump supporters outside of Donald Trump rallies. I met them in the bathrooms, as you said, at Donald Trump rallies, and they were very nice. And when they found out I was a reporter, they um, wanted to ask me a number of questions about what reporting was and how we did it and how we engaged with it. And, and then I asked them a number of questions about why they supported Donald Trump. It wasn't just because um, they thought he was an awesome guy. I mean, that wasn't really what I heard. I heard a lot of, yeah, he says what I'm thinking, but it was also people felt very frustrated and left behind and that Washington wasn't working for them. They were working for themselves. Um, and Donald Trump was somebody who wasn't a perfect candidate. Um, he was an imperfect messenger, but he was a messenger for their anger and their frustration, and that he was, he was at the very least, uh, going to shake up the system in a way that would force it to start working again. So you have to remember that. It's not because you can't paint them with, and I, I mean, I, I, I'm, are there any Donald Trump supporters in this room? You can't paint Donald Trump supporters with a broad brush. It's not fair to them, it's not fair to you, it's not fair to our democracy. There are many reasons why they supported him. It's not just because you wanna presume that they're racist or xenophobic or dumb or sexist. I'm sure there are certain people among those voters who have all those attributes, but not all of them. And it's a mistake to, to believe that. Don't shake your head. I talk to them. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm here to say that I think that they are all racist and sexist, but I have a different job than Katie. <laughs> but it, it's just not true. And I, and I, it's not I true. interviewed Guys, them too. It, but I it's not, it's just too. not, it's just not true. It's not true. I mean, you can be a very nice person and also be racist No, it's and not, yeah, yeah, but it's just, it's just, it's not true. To be continued, next question. Hey. You sound uh, like Donald Trump. You don't want to believe what I'm saying. Fake uh, news. Hey, uh, thank you for doing this. I think everyone here uh, has like a holy shit moment. Like, where were you when you thought that he had a realistic chance to actually pull this off and win? 
What was that like for you? Where were you? I was uh, standing on a, a street corner in um, uh, Carroll Gardens. I was talking on the phone to a senior member of the RNC, and they were telling me that Donald Trump was absolutely, absolutely going to be done with within a week because he had just gone after John McCain. And Republican voters will not accept that. Absolutely not. And I remember thinking, I wonder. Um, but the real moment where I realized that it wasn't going anywhere was, was the Mobile, uh, Alabama rally, which was a couple weeks later when 20,000 people showed up. So not only did they find it okay that he was going after an American veteran, a war hero, uh, they, they were excited by it. I mean, and these poll numbers went up. So that to me was the, this is going farther than, than we might expect it to go. Hey guys, thanks for being here. Um, so in the age of Trump, I think um, facts are, facts matter a lot and people kind of question um, the media's coverage sometimes where um, there's just like balance bias where you want to, um, you want to express both sides, give both sides a shot. Um, and I think it's, it seems to have changed a little bit where the media is fact checking in real time. I'm thinking about that CNN example in the Chiron where it says, Trump says Obama, the founder of ISIS. He's not. Um, and and it's, you're starting to see it a little bit more um, in the media, but um, do you think that that needs to happen more, uh, more um, in real time fact checking? Um, as opposed to the he said, she said kind of coverage. And then Katie, I think you are seeing a, a, lot, a lot more of the real time fact checking as opposed to the he said, she said coverage. I think that um, in, in, in this present time is a kind of for the most part, that sentence didn't make any sense, kind of for the most part, <laughs> is, has for the most part gone away. I think it's uh, at least what we do on MSNBC every day, which is you know what I mostly watch. We. Um, if he says something, you, you have a reporter immediately pushing back on it, or at the very least, a couple of uh, headstrong anchors doing exactly that, especially one at two o'clock every day. We do you appreciate that. You should obviously that. be watching at two o'clock every day. <laughs> Drop everything that you're doing if you're not already watching at 2 p.m. You had another question. Or, or DVR. How do you feel about sharing a nickname with Bob Corker? Oh, and Kim Jong Un and Marco Rubio. So That's true. we know our president has Good a very, company, very wide vocabulary. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, yes, hi, Katie. My name is Christopher Vicciola. I worked on Hillary Clinton's campaign in New York City, and I'm still with Hillary Clinton on onward together with her with her campaign. My question was, were you there when Donald Trump made a statement to the effect of, I like a good fist fight, I'll pay for your attorney's fees? Yeah. And it bothers me, the violence that he, that he infuriates in people. Um, it, 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 it's really dangerous, I feel. It, 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 I, was, I was at the, I was not at the rally where it happened. I might have been, I don't remember, it's all blurring together. Uh, it was a rally in, in Fayetteville, North Carolina, that a, uh, a protester, a black man, was sucker punched by an older white man. Um, and afterwards, a, a local crew caught up with the, with the man who sucker punched him, and he said, next time I see that guy, I'm gonna kill him. Donald Trump said at, at the next day, I believe, on Fox and Friends, uh, that he would pay for the man's legal fees. Uh, yeah, it was ugly. It was really ugly. I mean, and that was just one example. It happened all over. It happened all over. Um, but not just that. It was inside the rallies could be dangerous for protesters. Outside, uh, protesters would show up and, and supporters would, you know, they were itching to get at each other. They were itching to fight with each other and to scream at each other it was both sides in that respect to the point where uh, I hate saying that term both sides um, we know what you mean yeah uh, uh, riot police would would be in every town that Donald Trump showed up in very police. very shocking that this individual is representing our country it, it, it was shocking that we decided it was okay thank you to have that sort of violence. Hi, 
Um, so you had mentioned before in the book, you talked about not feeling like you knew what you were talking about and being an outsider versus an insider, but do you think that being sort of an insider in terms of political reporting was fundamentally different in any other administration versus the Trump administration? Oh, absolutely. I think you're totally right. I mean, there's just no rules of engagement any longer. Uh, you're, you can't trust that you're going to get um, a straight answer from anybody within the administration, that they're not, I mean, they're, they're used to spin, but just not outright lying to you. Uh, it's very hard to get them uh, to, to hand over even the most basic information. Um, and there is a, you're, you're an enemy. You're not just doing your job, you're an enemy, and you're not fair, and you're biased, and you're scum. So you're right, it is totally different um, with this, being an insider versus uh, being an outsider. Can I just jump in, moderator privilege? Can you explain Hope Hicks? Because she comes up again and again in your book, and she's sending these emails in Trump's voice. So even though they're Dictates saying- Dictates to her. Even though you're saying that, the, that they're treating you like the enemy. They are, it, to some extent, playing ball. And she's sort of like- Here and there. Never Here and fallen there. from Here grace. And there. So what's Here her deal? And there. It wasn't, they weren't playing ball as much as you would expect a professional campaign to do, as in like, you know, where are we going tomorrow? Um, yeah, she, he would dictate to her. Uh, she, so she would, you know, he, she emailed me after those tweets that, that after the coverage I had about, um, uh, protesters interrupting one of his speeches. I was tweeting about it, and I got an email from her, which I guess precipitated her, uh, Donald Trump, tweeting about me, saying, Mr. Trump didn't like your tweets. Disgraceful, not nice. <laughs> Best hope. <laughs> <laughs> and she's got this baby voice, too. And she's so got this so sweet baby that. voice. I mean, she, there's a great story at the end of the book when we're, you know, another, all the correspondents and producers are, are sitting around... Um, a st at a steakhouse drinking way too much wine and telling our, our war stories of the campaign trail. She calls one of uh, the correspondents, whose name I can't mention, says, are we off the record? And the correspondent says, yes. And she <laughs> says, good, Mr. Trump wants me to tell you to go F yourself. <laughs> but she said the word. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so she was like the, she was the deliverer, and I think still is the deliverer of Donald Trump's messages. You know, he doesn't use email, so he can't you know email you himself. And she's a true believer. From all outward appearances. Very interesting. Okay, I don't mean to step on the the next questioner. Go right ahead, please. Uh -oh. Um, during Obama's last correspondence dinner, he made a joke saying that the uh, press gave Trump the appropriate seriousness of coverage that his campaign deserved, saying he, um, he wanted to give his hotel chains a boost, and now he's running, and now he's the nominee. Um, I'm not saying I agree with that critique specifically, but uh, do you think the press made any mistakes in covering Trump, and what do you think those were? I think we need to yes. take a hard look at, at how we covered it and what we can do better. I, I, we were in a tough spot because, um, yeah, he was dragging us to his properties, which was just a very transparent effort to get free publicity for those properties. I mean, and I would say that on the air, this is a transparent effort to get free publicity for this golf course I'm standing on. But then again, I'm standing on the freaking golf course. Mm -hmm. um, but he was the presidential... He's a GOP nominee. I mean, whenever he spoke, it made news. You, you, you had to follow him just because uh, if something happened to him, we needed to be there. So we were in a, you know, a, 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 a double-edged sword, you know, a rock and a hard place. I'm going to choose my cliche. A Catch rock and 22. a hard place. Catch-22. You had to be there, but you knew you were being used while you were there. Uh, for 2020, I, I hope we have a, a powwow, all of us that might cover 2020 and decide how we can do it better uh, to better get the message out. And I think that that involves less of the Donald Trump said this in this moment and more of the what are voters thinking and what do they care about. I mean, did he know in a sense, to me it feels like he knew how, he, he's a television man, he's an entertainer, right? So he knew how to keep the camera on him. So how do you both cover that that's happening and not get played by it? You, you just, you're honest about it. At one yeah. point, you know, he, he, he kept saying, and I'm sure you remember this, ah, oh, those cameras back there, they won't turn. Why aren't you turning the camera? You, turn the camera, turn the camera. But he would say that, and this, this man knows he can't turn the camera because he's, <laughs> his job is to, shoot us, to take video of us. And the man standing there at every Trump rally, or the woman, their job is to not move their camera. 
because their camera is being fed to a number of the TV stations, a pool, and everybody is using the same feed, and everyone else has their own camera there, and those cameras are cutting away and showing the crowd. But Donald Trump knew that that camera wasn't supposed to do it, and so he would turn the crowd, and the crowd would see that that camera wasn't moving, and he'd yell and scream, and he'd, he would make it seem like that guy was just, you know, or the girl was in defiance of him, and the crowd would say, ah, oh, yeah, he's right. Well, he knew what he was doing was a blatant lie, and so you stand there on television, you say, this is part of his shtick. He knows that camera is not supposed to move. You just call him out for it. Yeah, and I think you... He knows. Yeah, I mean, come he on. He has knows. his own TV show. No, and, he understands. And, and all credit to you because you did it all the time. And I couldn't imagine what it would be like to do it from the belly of the beast. To say, this is not true. And then to go, you know, stand in front of them and be with them and travel with them every day is really difficult. And it's a tremendous testament to your courage. Um, we have time for just two more questions. So there's a little five minute sign here. There's so, three so, people. Okay. Come on, we can do three Okay, people. we're going to do be a, a light. Okay. Uh, why don't you guys all ask your questions three in a row, and Katie will decide how she wants to answer yes, them. Yes, that's a good idea. And what you just said is how I was going to begin, which is that you deserve a lot of credit for maintaining your equilibrium you. under those conditions, covering the rallies <laughs> and what they put you through, and, and for your r reporting and for your anchoring. But what I want to ask about is now he's president, and clearly he would like to run the presidency like a reality TV show and be the center of attention constantly. But I feel that the media, particularly the news networks, are taking the bait too much. And it's not your decision, obviously, but my point is, every, if, if they spend two weeks talking about the fact that did Rex Tillerson call him a moron or did he call him an effing moron, that's time taken away from concentrating, let's say on, f to use just one example out of maybe 30, that Scott Pruitt on a daily basis is ruining the Environmental Protection Administration. Okay, thank you very much, sir. That, we, let's get the next question and then Katie I, I, will, will I, take a stab. I don't disagree with you. <laughs> Our friend Corrine. Hi, um, I know you saw me basically shaking my head absolutely no um, to being able one. to bridge the gap with Trump supporters. And one of the reasons is because I feel like the campaign and everything that a lot of his supporters stand for is to try and deny my humanity as a woman of color. And so it's very, very hard to think about the long march of history and everything that has already happened in this country that now I would have to have the job to try and explain why I deserve to be here to someone else. So for what I wanted to ask you is, I have been very angry since the campaign. I've been angry since the election. And I'm basically a completely changed person from who I was before. So what I wanted to ask you is, do you have any tips for bridging the gap? <laughs> <laughs> just that. Well, thank you. And we're just going to hear one more. And then Katie's going to be able to answer all three at once, right? Because she's a pro. <laughs> Along those same lines, I just I wonder if you have any thoughts, given everything that everyone has said, about because we consume our news from such different sources, I want to go from where we're at instead of where we want to be. We have to, in my opinion, go from where we are and meet people where they're at. Yeah. And so that's very important to me. So I wonder, if, as a journalist, if you know how we can do that. Um, it's just, when, it's small. <laughs> you got to do the small things. You're not gonna, you're not gonna convince everybody that they're, they, what they're doing you think is wrong. Um, that's not gonna happen. You have to try and push back in small ways. You have the conversation. You try to, you try to explain your side. You try to hear them explain their side. You try to understand and then you try to talk. It is not always gonna work. You just, it's, we just don't have the, the gift of being able to convince everybody of everything all the time. But it's important to have the conversation because if you have the conversation, you can make a connection and connections can change minds. If your friends uh, share something on Facebook that is not true, try to share something that is true in return. Um, try not to, to feed into the mob mentality either on Twitter or on Facebook. Don't post tirade. I mean, I don't think it's great, great for everybody to be posting tirades every day and to be screaming at the other side and calling them names because it just entrenches people. 
You think I'm a racist? Well, I'm gonna be a racist. You think I'm a sexist? Well, I'm gonna be a sexist. I, I, you gotta appeal to the better, uh, better angels of people. And then you try, and you try and find some common ground. And we need to, because we are really angry. And I mean, it's not just the right, which you know will flood my Twitter feed with hateful, angry messages calling me names. If I question a Democrat in a way that a Democrat doesn't like, they flood my feed with hateful, angry messages calling me names. It is the same thing on both sides. Sometimes one is more prevalent than the mm -hmm. other. And one side's in the White House. But still, I mean, it's it's on it, it's on all of our backs to to make this country a better place. Well, I I want to thank all of you here. I can feel the emotion and the anger and the fear in the room. Thank you for your questions. Thank you most of all to Katie for your reporting and for your courage. The book is unbelievable, and you should buy it. Buy the book, unbelievable. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you to Arin, who's amazing. Our editor, Julia, is here, and she is really good at remembering faces, and she's watching to make sure that you're all buying a book. <laughs>